world leaders really in educational research. So we're incredibly lucky to get an academic from that to come on and talk to you about that. And any of you that have signed in are obviously interested in potential careers in education, this is a kind of a, a strong um, a group of people as you could have to discuss that with you. And we've also got Hannah Legg with us, who, who's a long time kind of associate of ours, as long as I've been working out here, she's been the international rep for Southeast Asia for UCL. So any broader UCL questions as well, we've got Hannah that can answer those. Um, it's a reminder, as always, for those of you that have joined us before, if you want to ask any questions at all, um, then please put them in the chat function. Just add them there. I will put them to, to Jack or Hannah at the end of the session, or we'll answer them ourselves if they're ones that we can answer anyway. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jack now, and he's going to tell you a little bit about um, um, Institute of Education at UCL and uh, a bit more about his, the kind of educational research that he does. Jack. Fantastic. Thanks very much. And good morning to everybody from, uh, from the UK. Um, today I want to talk to you a little bit about education studies at the Institute of Education. As was just mentioned, I'm really lucky to work in one of um, the leading centres for education studies in the world. Um, it's a fantastic place to be working um, where we manage to uh, draw on a number of disciplines uh, to really think critically about what education is. So in the session today over the next 20 to 40 minutes, I want to talk through what education studies is. Often people think of education just as something that happens within the classroom, something that's happening within their own classrooms as they're growing up. But I want to broaden out an idea of what education might be um, to help us think about some of the ways in which the different disciplines in our degree, the different subjects in our degree can help us to think about education in a much more broader sense and think about the way in which education might impact upon society upon politics and upon economics. So when I was putting this session together, I had to think about uh, the, the image to have on my, on my front page. So of course, what we've got and what you can see here is a generic image of a classroom, which nicely sums up what we might mean by education studies. Again, it's this focus on education, something that often happens with children and something that happens in the classroom. But I was thinking, and this is related a little bit to my research, about how education might be thought of more broadly. And so I'll show you another image now, and I'll maybe come back to it at the end of the session, just to explain why it is, why I think this is a fundamental image when it comes to thinking about the importance of education. Uh, and what, I'll maybe leave it with you until then to think about why this image might be relevant. But the other image I was thinking about having on the front page of my, of my presentation today was this image from just two weeks ago. Uh, this is, if you've been following the news in the US, uh, is the storming of the US Capitol building, the US Parliament building, um, by protesters who are unhappy with the election result. Um, I think there's an educational question here, um, and I'm really interested in, as an educator, um, what it is that's going on here. So, as I'm talking through my PowerPoint, uh, also just having the back of your mind some thoughts maybe about um, why this moment here is a moment that should speak to educators as much as to politics, journalists, the police, etc. Okay, so maybe I'll just introduce myself a little bit. Um, as uh, has been said, I work at the Institute of Education. Um, my training is um, as a philosopher and as a psychoanalyst. So that means that I uh, 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 use tools from both philosophy, that's mainly philosophy of mind and political philosophy, um, to think about education and society, as well as psychoanalysis which is the study of the mind and of thinking and of emotions. And I use those subjects to think about both how um, children themselves, as well as adults, learn and develop. But I also use political philosophy to think about the ways in which education impacts upon wider society. So again, what we've got this image of this image here is one of education that relates directly to the classroom children's minds, how they learn, how they develop, but political philosophy that helps us to think about how education is actually functioning in this wider sense. Of course, we don't stop learning as soon as we leave school or college or university. We continue to learn throughout the entirety of our lives. And so in a variety of settings, it's really important to have 
a knowledge and understanding of what it means to be a human learner and a human knower. That means not just being a good classroom teacher or a good head teacher, but to be a good employer, you need to think about those things. To be a good researcher, you need to think about those things. To be a good journalist, you need to think about how it is that your reader is learning from what you're saying. To work in TV news or to put films together, you've got to have a knowledge of how the human mind works and how your audiences are learning from what it is that you're presenting to them. As a policymaker, as someone working in government, it's also really important to have an understanding of how it is that humans become, how it is that humans develop, humans' aspirations and the skills and tools that they might wish to have a flourishing future. So in that sense, education, again, when we think about it critically, isn't just something that's happening in the classroom, but the skills and tools that we develop as part of education studies have applications and implications across the whole of society, the whole of the economy, and the whole of our shared future um, uh, as we think towards um, some moment uh, that hopefully we can build that's to come. So again, let's think about defining what education studies is. Well, we can think about education as merely human development. And as I said before, of course, the most common way of thinking about education relates to educating children into the world to become citizens of the future. And so we might think about this as I've said at the bottom here, developing children with, within academic skills and qualifications that will help them to go on perhaps to college and university or to a workplace um, and to help them fulfill an important role in the economy, to help them lead independent uh, lives and a self-supporting life, how is it they gain skills to support themselves uh, uh, in their own futures. However, I want to think about education today in a much broader sense, not just focusing on the classroom as we see in this first picture here, but I want to think about education outside of the classroom too. So I'm just going to refer you to uh, a project uh, that's currently um, active at the World Bank. So the World Bank is an institution uh, that's, uh, that, that funds um, uh, development projects across the world. And of course, as, as well as, as giving money, lending money to fund uh, different countries' processes of development. It also seeks to build policy to try and help countries maximise the opportunities um, for their citizens, but also for their economies. And recently the World Bank changed the way in which it, it, it measured the success of a country's economy. So previously this would have been something called GDP or gross domestic product. How much money is the country making? How much money is, it in, is its industries pumping out? How economically efficient is the country? But over the last few years, the World Bank has changed its emphasis to consider what it calls human capital. And it's, it's developed a tool called the Human Capital Index. So human capital refers to the opportunities for flourishing that exist within a particular country or economy, the opportunities for development, the skills that are available, um, as well as the barriers that might be in front of, of, of young people and adults as they attempt to develop themselves over their whole entire lifespan. So if we look at the text uh, at the bottom there, it reads that the Human Capital Index measures the amount of human capital that a child born today can expect to attain by age 18, given the risks of poor health and poor education that prevail in the country, uh, where she um, uh, was born, uh, and improvements in current health and educational outcomes, the way in which they shape the productivity of the next generation of workers, assuming that children born today experience over the next 18 years, the educational opportunities and health risks that children in any range currently face. So the reason for showing you this is to begin to think about the fact that one teacher in one classroom, of course, does a fantastic and amazing job in educating children and giving them skills in developing them as future citizens. At the same time, there are factors outside of that classroom that impact on that child's ability to learn. So those factors may be um, uh, 
poor health, they may be social disadvantage and poverty, uh, they may be a lack of resources, etc. So when we're thinking about education, we shouldn't only be thinking about what it means to be a teacher standing in front of a, a, a board with children in front of us, transmitting information to those children and helping them to learn as they directly sit in front of us. When we're thinking about education, we also need to be thinking about those other factors that impact on those children's ability to learn, act as a barrier to their ability to learn. And so I've written here in summary, it's, oops, my screen has just frozen. There we go. It's important to think about education as a classroom practitioner. Um, let me just, my screen is frozen, so I just need to, there we go. Uh, so it's important to think about education as a classroom practitioner, as someone who teaches directly the children in front of them. But we can already see from that World Bank project that if education prepares the citizens of tomorrow, and if we want a fair society and a well-functioning society, when we think about education, we also need to think like the World Bank, to be thinking of a variety of factors that intersect with and impact on our ability to educate. We need to think about what we are educating for and how. And so what skills might we need to do this work? So I think the skills that we need to think about how to do this work are skills that are very much inculcated into the education studies degree at the Institute of Education. There's a self plug, that's a photo I took on a very um, early September morning of the Institute in London. Our degree is a broad social science degree uh, and it introduces students to the disciplines of philosophy, sociology, psychology and history. So again, we might think of education as just being a teacher in front of a student with really good subject knowledge. If they're a maths teacher, they know their maths really well. If they're a geography teacher, they know their geography really well. If they're a history teacher, they know their history really well. But we at the Institute say that no, actually being a teacher and being an educational decision maker is more than that. So as well as subject knowledge, if you want to be a teacher, good educational decision makers and good educational leaders need to be given the critical skills to think about education as being more than what just happens in the classroom. And through the disciplines of philosophy, sociology, psychology and history, we give students the skills in which to do this broader work. So this means that at the Institute, as I say, I feel very lucky to work there. We have philosophers, sociologists, psychologists, and historians working to provide our students with the tools to understand how to become good teachers if they wish, yeah, how to become good classroom practitioners. And indeed, most of our students go on to become leaders in education because of course they're given these critical skills to imagine um, new possibilities within education, not to just continue practice as it is, but to think beyond current practice in education. However, we also provide students with the critical tools to understand education within its wider context. So our students understand how to engage with and to design educational policy. Yeah, so when governments are thinking about how to improve the education systems, they need to ask people who have a knowledge of how the education system works, about human minds work, about how um, different social factors impact upon the ability of children to learn. So our students are engaged with and, and, and develop an ability to design educational policy. They understand how to think about um, how education both contributes to as, and is impacted by wider societal forces. And our students think critically about social justice and education, as well as that they think about how the human brain um, works, how the human brain learns, and some of the ways in which societal forces might impact on processes of learning and development. I just want to give you an example of that. So there's a fantastic theory by a, a, a sociologist and theorist uh, uh, called um, Pierre Bourdieu. And he writes about um, uh, a theory called uh, a theory of habitus. So they basically, he's thinking about what he calls social, cultural and economic capital. So social capital for Bourdieu is who you know. So the social networks that you've been initiated into, 
and what the people in those social networks can tell you, the signposts that they can give you to help you towards some form of success. This is contrasted with cultural capital, which is not who you know, but is what you know. The cultural reference that you have, the books you've read, the level of education that you've got, the kind of education that you've got, um, the way in which you engage with culture. And this is differentiated by Bourdieu from economic capital, which is literally the money that you have to spend within the economy, again, to give yourself some kind of benefit. So Bourdieu thinks that these three elements are incredibly important for thinking about how societies work. And I think that Bourdieu actually can give us as educators, both at the classroom level and the policy level, um, some really good starting points to think about pupil attainment. So I'll run through an example with you in which I think these ideas of social capital, that's who you know, and how who you know um, uh, signposts you to success within your particular society. Cultural capital, that's what you know, and economic capital, that's the money that you have to spend. How these things can impact upon a child's performance within the classroom. So I'll tell you a story of two pupils, pupil A and pupil B. So pupil A and pupil B are in year 10 in a UK classroom. They're both beginning to learn Shakespeare. So in the, 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 the British education system, at least, Shakespeare is a really important playwright that, that every child learns and reads and has to read. But of course, Shakespeare was writing a long time ago. And so the, the language that Shakespeare uses is sometimes a little bit difficult. And of course, the theatrical practices that Shakespeare was engaged with are not something that we're seeing in our everyday lives today. So sometimes Shakespeare, an important playwright, is just out of the reach of our pupils. It's, it's something that's difficult for them uh, that they need to learn to love. So we've got these two pupils, pupil A and pupil B, who are both learning Shakespeare for the first time in school. Now, let's think about the social, cultural and economic capital that pupil A has. So people A has been taken to the theatre by their parents once a month for the last five years. As a result of this, they've learned the language of the British theatre. So they've not always been watching Shakespeare in the theatre, but they've been you know, getting used to the way in which the theatre works, the language and expectations and cultural practices of British theatre. And they may have seen some Shakespeare plays as well. So in terms of the social capital that that child has, well, their family unit and the people around them are in a social network in which it's normal to go to the theatre. Amongst their friends, they might see, say, go and see this play. Or it might be that amongst their friends and amongst that family, someone might give them a tip about a good play that's going on that's being placed on the theatre in, in London at that moment or somewhere else in the UK. Um, in terms of who they know, those parents are within a network in which it's normal to engage in that practice. Culturally then, we might think that that child's parents themselves were taken to the theater as children, themselves are of an educational level where they've learned and read Shakespeare and other playwrights, themselves as they have been to the theater and are within a cultural network in which this is normal. Right? It's normal to go to the theater every month. At the same time, in terms of their economic capital, they have the disposable income to spend on tickets to go to the theatre for three or four people every month. So in that case, the social, cultural and economic capital, who you know and what's normal within that group, what you know um, and how that relates to, in this case, the curriculum and the money that you have to spend means that child A gets a fantastic set of experiences that set them up really well so that when they're learning Shakespeare for the first time in the classroom, it's not new to them. They've had a series of experiences that have prepared them to do well as they're reading and writing about and trying to understand this otherwise obscure playwright who was writing 400 years ago. Let's instead then think about pupil B. So pupil B, their parents, 
have, are not in a social group in terms of their social capital that often goes to the theatre. No one's telling them about the latest play that's on uh, within their social group. No one's really going to the theatre and they don't see someone going to the theatre, so it's not normal to them. At the same time, their cultural capital means that they don't have an educational level in which they've studied English literature or theatre or other similar subjects that relate to, to British theatre. Um, uh, and culturally, they're not really used to being in, in, in what we might call high art spaces. Instead, that child, for their entertainment, maybe watches cartoons or plays on a PlayStation. At the same time then, that family might not have the economic capital to spend on three or four tickets to go to the theatre every month. Uh, the, the, the disposable income, the extra cash just isn't there to, 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 to deal with that expense. As a result of that child's social, cultural and economic capital, we can see that that child B has not been given those same experiences that would help them to understand Shakespeare um, uh, immediately. They've not got the cultural references. They've not got the social references that would also make it normal. In a sense, they're not seeing their own lives reflected in the curriculum. So we can begin to see this distinction between pupil A and pupil B. Pupil A sees something of their, their, their everyday life reflected in the curriculum, in the classroom, and what's being asked of them in terms of the expectations of their learning. They've got a head start. Pupil B, on the other hand, doesn't see themselves reflected in that curriculum. They don't have a head start. In fact, they're at something of a disadvantage because of where their position in terms of their family's social, cultural, and economic capital. We can imagine the ways in which, because of these differentiated experiences, people A will do quite well when in their Shakespeare class. People B won't do as well within their Shakespeare class. They'll struggle, they'll find it more difficult literally just because of the experiences that they've had up until now that have prepared them for this moment. Now, as a teacher in a classroom, it would be really easy for me to say that pupil A is the A grade student. They work really hard, they're intelligent, they're achieving really well in my class. We're gonna give them you know, their A-star grades, they're the ideal image of our student, we're really happy with them. At the same time, it would be really easy for me as a teacher to look at pupil B and say, they're not doing very well, they can't be working very hard, um, uh, maybe they're not as intelligent as people A, maybe they're lazy, maybe they just don't have a talent for, for, for learning Shakespeare or for thinking about the theatre, and as a result, my low expectations as a teacher might mean that I write that pupil off. I'll try my best with them, but I just don't expect them to do very well. I think this is a pattern in many classrooms in which teachers see pupil performance as being as a result of, or being sourced from some inherent ability in the pupil's brain. Too often this isn't the case as Bourdieu's theory of habitus tells us and can show us. Too often there are invisible yes. senses. Yes. Quick question, is your slide stuck on the previous page? Did you change any slides um, or did you not change any slides? Uh, no. No, it's not. I haven't changed it yet. Oh, okay. It's not just, just one you because yeah. the student is wondering. <laughs> Got it. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I was just going to say it's really easy for uh, a teacher to diagnose uh, a pupil as a pupil A as being an A star student, really fantastic student. People B being a D grade student, the student who's lazy and not working very hard. But in fact, we might think of this as being instead as a result of the wider forces that are invisible when the pupils are sitting in front of us in the classroom, but that are very active in society outside of the classroom. So society outside of the class impacts upon what we do inside of the classroom. However good a teacher we are, however much we know our subject, however much we know how to communicate our subject to our pupils, unless we've been given these critical skills, that is the critical skills that in the Institute we developed through philosophy, sociology, psychology and history, looking philosophically at how minds work, uh, how education functions, looking sociologically, as Bourdieu helps us to, about how social forces impact upon education, looking psychologically at human development, looking historically about how education has done in the past. Unless we're also thinking about these things, we could be the best teacher in the world, and yet we could still be failing our pupils by not being the most critical about how it is that 
we view them and the barriers that are impacting them upon their own educational journey. As a result then, I think that on our education studies degree, we encourage our students to think big about education. Yeah. I don't know what thinking small about education is, but at least thinking big about education means thinking with the broadest mindset possible um, to think about all of the variables that might be impacting upon the moment of teaching and learning. And as I say, this is incredibly important for teachers in the classroom, Teachers need to think big about education, not to just see what's in front of them, but to think wider and beyond what's immediately apparent to them when they're looking at pupil A and pupil B. But it's also important to think big about education when we're working in government, advising governments about education, whether we're working in workplaces and we want to develop our workers' skills and help them to become better workers, but also to flourish in their own lives. When we're thinking as journalists about how it is that we communicate um, whatever it is about the world, whether it's politics, whether it's the climate emergency, whether it's social justice, whether it's the economy, when we're communicating as journalists to our readers, we need to be thinking educationally about how it is that our readers, our diverse readers, will receive and learn from our information. So we encourage our students to think big about education. We encourage our students to learn creatively or to think creatively about education. Education is not this fixed thing. It's not just teacher and student, but instead teachers can think about the ways in which creatively they might change up that relationship, change their classrooms, change their schools to make their schools respond to these wider barriers to children's learning that exist outside of the schools to give every single child um, a fair chance, an equal opportunity in their educational journey. And then I think our students are given the tools to imagine new social, economic and technological futures and to think about the ways in which education will play a role in building those futures. Now that's a big claim, right? So thinking about new social, economic and technological futures, that seems so futuristic and a bit science fiction-y. But I think education is at the heart of our tomorrow. And this is not only in the sense that education is often focused on the young who will become citizens of tomorrow. But education as its best responds to the social situation that we're in right now. It prepares our students, if we're getting education right, to be equal and flourishing citizens in tomorrow's democracies. Education thinks about the economy. Education responds to economic needs. It responds to the jobs of the future by preparing the children and adults of today for that economic future. But it also engages with technology and it has to think about the cutting edge of technology. What's our technological future? In what ways will technology um, not only replace our jobs, but be integral to other jobs? And how can we give our young people the skills in order to make sure that they're ready for that new technological future? So in a sense, education is at the heart of what our tomorrow might be. And our degree at least, but in education studies in general, in general, we're really trying to help our students think about what that future might be and how it is that we might prepare, our, uh, uh, prepare or use education to prepare for that future. So I just wanna think about some of the destinations out of our degree then. Of course, a large number of our students go on to become teachers. Um, it's probably not as large as you think, um, uh, but a large number of our students who do education studies um, go on to become teachers, and that's in the UK and across the world. And as I say, the Institute of Education is, a, is, is, a, is, is famous around the world for both education research and teacher training. But as well as that, we I'm just sort of put this, this slide together from students that I could remember just off the top of my head. Students have gone on to do MAs in human rights. They've gone on to become journalists, youth workers. We have students who work in government, advising government about education policy. Um, we have students who work advising uh, think tanks about education policy. We have students who go on to do master's degrees in sociology, philosophy. 
We have students who go on to train as educational psychologists, clinical psychologists. We have students who work in human resources, which I always find incredibly interesting, but of course, right? Uh, they work in human resources. Um, in particular, they focus upon career development, looking at how it is that within an organization, um, uh, people who are employed by that organization might develop their own career and their own learning within the organization. We also have a student who's the head of marketing um, and branding at a, at a major food company who uses their skills, knowing how it is that we learn and how it, we think and how the brain develops to build persuasive arguments um, about uh, the products that she's trying um, uh, to promote. So the reason why I mention these destinations is because education studies, again, often has, to return to my first slide, this image of relating to one classroom with a teacher and a group of students and this relationship between them. Now, of course, education is that, but education is almost also so much more because education really relates to what it means to learn and to become as a human being. And none of us do that merely within one classroom with one teacher. We do that across the entirety of our lives, but we do that within a social and economic context, which needs to be part of the way in which we understand how education is functioning. So I want to, in the last five minutes, just talk through the work of two of my colleagues at the Institute. Um, uh, they're both people who I work with quite closely. On the left hand side uh, is Professor Jan Derry. Uh, so Jan Derry is a professor of philosophy and education uh, and she works on the philosophical and psychological theories of learning and neuroscience and development. And she asks questions about how brains and minds learn and continue learning throughout their lives. So of course Jan's work is incredibly important um, for classroom practice and she speaks directly to teachers and to school leaders about how to improve their work in order to make learning more effective. However her work has implications for learning in universities so she at least speaks within UCL and other universities across the UK about how to make learning as effective as possible for university and college students but her work it also is something that applies in workplaces um, and she has PhD students working with her that work in a variety of fields outside of what we would call conventional education, but that are interested in brains and learning and development. Um, so on the one hand, we've got Jan, who's working on brains, learning and development with these implications for classroom practice, but of course, for, the, for questions about how we learn outside of the classroom too. On the other hand, there's Dr. Nelly Ali on the right hand side there. Um, uh, she's a senior teaching fellow in education on our program. She works specifically on the um, BA in education studies. Her work is less to do with brains and neuroscience and has a more sociological leaning. In particular, Nelly works uh, researching children um, uh, uh, in Egypt, um, but in particular street children. So these are some of the poorest children uh, in the country, uh, Egypt, that she is working in. This means that Nelly's work interrogates some of the social and economic factors that hugely impact on these children's lives. And that means that by researching the difficulties that these children have in just getting to school, let alone learning in the classroom, Jan would focus on how is it that we can set up the classroom to help these children learn better. Nelly's work is looking at the barriers that stop these children even getting to the classroom that mean that these children don't sometimes um, have the resources spent on them to provide them with an education. And this means that she can advise governments, both in Egypt and around the world, about how to improve outcomes for some of the poorest children in the world. At the same time though, I think Nelly's work has implications for all teachers. So she's working specifically on Egypt and on Sub-Saharan Africa. And she's thinking about barriers to education that those children face. But of course, there's poverty in almost every country in the world. And so her work has implications for all teachers. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I just wanna to return to this picture. Um, and just, I don't know if you have any thoughts about why you might think um, uh, this is a, a picture that relates to education studies. And I say, it relates somewhat to, to, to my work and my research. Um, 
the storming of the Capitol building in the US just a couple of weeks ago. My work uh, as a philosopher and as a psychoanalyst um, engages with our ability to think and reason and our rationality, our ability to make rational decisions. Now, I'm interested in this in classroom contexts and in terms of citizenship education, but I'm also interested in this in terms of human rights. So a major strand of my research is thinking about how it is that we educate um, young people as well as adults to fully see the human dignity of others. So I look at different moments of human rights abuses across history, particularly the last 400 years. And I think about human rights abuses taking place in the world right now. And I ask questions about how education might step in, that school-based education, but that's also the kind of education that might take place in the media. How education might step in to make sure that we fully recognize the human dignity of others, and as a result, have an equitable and fair society. This comes under the banner of citizenship education in many contexts. One of the central planks of the work that I do is looking at our new political reality. So 20, 30 years ago, it was still the case that our political decision-making was informed by media. That is by an, a, a small number of TV show, uh, stations giving us news, reporting on what governments were doing, reporting on different political parties' agendas or newspapers that were doing something similar. And in a sense, because newspapers and TV um, uh, uh, news uh, companies were regulated and were very public, it meant that there's a regulation of news content. So the material being given to us to make our political decisions is regulated by the conversation that takes place between these different news sources so that we as citizens can make a decision about how it is that we want to vote for our next leaders and for the direction of the country or the areas that we live in. What strikes me about the storming of the capital in the US is the ways in which the internet, in particular social media, is this new means, this new source of information and disinformation about the state of our countries and our politics. So for example, if the President of the United States wants to say that the election has been stolen, he no longer needs to merely um, uh, go to news companies who might question him, who might provide alternative data to say, actually, you know, we've got this information to say that even though the president's saying the election's stolen, uh, here's some alternative evidence that might make us think again about whether this is true or not. Rather than that more regulated context, we're entering into a new era in which social media means that anyone can publish anything, any opinion or any attitude, and if we're not careful, it can go unchallenged. It can appear very real. This means that as political decision makers, as voters, the material we have available to us becomes increasingly chaotic, it becomes increasingly confusing, and we as political decision makers, as voters, are more and more susceptible to manipulation um, because we're not making these collective decisions together in a tested environment. Instead, the internet is this environment in which anyone can publish anything and get it disseminated on a Facebook feed on a Twitter feed, on an Instagram feed. I want to ask questions about how it is that we prepare young people in particular, but adults too, uh, as they're engaging with social media and news media, how it is that we prepare people, how we educate people to see through these narratives and to be in a position to critically be aware of the ways in which they might be being manipulated so that when they make their political decisions, they're doing so with the best information available to them. And perhaps the question here, perhaps what we saw on the news in the Capitol building in the US uh, two weeks ago shows a failing in this process. It shows a group who wholeheartedly believed that they were doing the right thing because an election had been stolen. And yet the information, the material that they've been given to cognate, to think about whether that election had been stolen or not was unreliable. And this is an educational issue because it's education that is at the heart of providing us with the critical skills to see through narratives and messages that are supplied to us that may be incorrect, that may be manipulating us. Autonomy in a political sense 
comes from being educated to think for ourselves rather than uncritically following media narratives that are provided to us um, uh, through, for example, social media or through someone that we meet in a cafe who might want to, to, to try and hoodwink us into, into thinking something that maybe isn't true. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up my session there uh, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. On the screen right now is my email. If you'd like to email me any questions about education studies, I'm very happy to um, answer them. My Twitter feed's there also, but also the Twitter feed of the, um, uh, the uh, Education Studies Programme at UCL IOE. Thank you so much for listening. I was saying, really, really interested in hearing your questions. Thank you, Jack. That was absolutely fantastic. A really fascinating look at education there. Really appreciate that. Um, can I just ask as well, just in terms of this being your kind of key area of research and looking at this, I mean, have you have you come up with anything? Have you found any kind of strategies for kind of, obviously it's a bit difficult to, the genie has a, is out the bottle in terms of media and the diffuse nature of things coming in. I mean, what kind of strategies have you, in, in your research have you come across that educators can use to try and allow people to, to critically analyze such a diverse range of, of content? Yeah, that's a super good question. Um, so I, I, I actually take um, the, the work of a, of, a, of a German philosopher called Theodor Adorno, who was actually looking at how narratives formed in Germany in the 1930s. So the way in which the media um, formed a kind of anti-Semitic narrative that led to the Holocaust. Of course, that's you know one of the worst moments in in in, in recent European history, and, and it feels that you know there's kind of like a sledgehammer cracking up when you think about the mass human rights abuses at that time, and then strongly the capital. But I think Adorno has some really good strategies for this, and he suggests that the most important thing for us um, as humans is to encounter cases of contradiction. So he says. It's really natural for us to get stuck in ways of thinking. The technical term is reification. Our thinking gets concretized and um, we increasingly think in, in, in ways that just are passed to us by our local culture. Uh, but these thinking ways of thinking can often be wrong. But he says, if we encounter contradiction, then there's this moment where our thinking works less smoothly. And then the moment of encountering a contradiction, we can do one of two things. We can either say that's wrong or we can be prepared to say and educated to say, okay, hang on a minute, is this wrong or is this a challenge to my way of thinking? And in a sense for Adorno, it's less about giving someone information, saying here's the correct information. For Adorno, what's really important educationally is preparing people to, to have the disposition of mind to be in that position. When I see a contradiction, when I see something I disagree with, is it wrong or is it a challenge to my way of thinking? And in working through that and being the kind of person that can work through that, you're in a much more autonomous position in the sense that you yourself get to decide. You yourself get to act upon the material to decide critically whether it's true to evaluate it rather than the material acting upon you. And I think far too often, especially with social media, we're so used to just receiving information from it, passively receiving information from it, rather than saying, hang on a minute, um, is this, is, this, is this right? And the other thing I'd just quickly say about that is that algorithms in social media give us what we already think. Right? So the algorithm measures us, it decides what we've already been looking at, what we might think politically, and it gives us more of the same. And part of my worry educationally is that an algorithm means that we don't get the kind of contradiction that we would normally get when we disagree with someone. In the, in the real world. The algorithm is almost channeling what we can see to what we already think, so that those chances to really engage with different thinking and to say, is this true? Or is this a, a, a challenge to my, to my thought? That's no longer happening because algorithms are feeding us increasingly narrow, narrow views. So, so the, the in terms of material- chamber, as they called it. The echo, absolutely, yeah, it, the echo chamber. So increasing the way in echo chambers where the chance to do this, this thinking and to prepare ourselves for this kind of critical thinking are, are being diminished. Okay, top life hack there for not ending up storming a capital building is to think critically yes. about information <laughs> coming in. Um, so we've got some more, you know, more about the kind of career side of things now. Maybe this is to have a look in terms of where your students have gone on to. So I've got a couple of questions around that. One is a bit more, and 
obviously we've got quite a diverse mixture of students. Some are from the UK, some from other parts of the world, and many are from Malaysia. So we've got a big, a large, uh, diverse group of students. One is, I suppose, we'd have to look from a UK perspective on this: is students that have gone on to work within the government or in an advisory role directly. What's your experience of those students? What what kind of pathways have they gone down? So different different pathways. So some, uh, I think there's one student who went directly to work in um, uh, Department of Education, um, and they work um, uh, on yeah advising um, actually on, on academies, which is um, a different kind of school provision. Um, another student um, uh, actually then went on to do a master's degree with us at UCL um, in philosophy of education. Uh, and at the same time as doing that, they interned on a refugee project, um, so they could do this, the same, the two at once. And straight out of that, then they got a job in the European Commission, advising on um, uh, youth and culture, um, in particular for um, uh, disadvantaged students across the e EU. Um, so th there is, you know, I say, one student went straight into um, uh, a, a grad. It's a grad scheme, so it's a graduate program uh, within government. Another student uh, went and did a master's, uh, did an internship, and then uh, got this job within uh, the EU Commission. I would say that yeah, partly, um, I'd say this to all students wherever you study, um, but it's really important to supplement um, uh, your studies with activities alongside that are going to help you reach your goals um, and you see how this is fantastic for um, providing um, uh, a series of sort of extracurricular activities that mean you can get a taste for um, uh, be it policy or be it you know working in sports or be it working in um, other cultural organizations that that sit alongside your studies um, I'd actually encourage students to do that it was particularly successful for the second student I'm talking about Brilliant. Thank you. That gives you some idea. I mean, again, we've got things like the civil service as well. Obviously, just as a broad based degree, you'd actually be eligible to go and uh, do the, the civil service entry exams and do that, too. So there's and, and obviously going into working with local MPs or whatever. And um, we've got a similar parliamentary system here in Malaysia. So there'll be some similarities. Obviously, that's something we can look into for you as well. Um, so I've got another one here just on the careers. And, and it's quite a direct question, really, is what the careers where you combine psychology in education what, what what kind of things are we talking about there jack okay that's a, an excellent question so there are some uh, very clear technical pathways so if you want to train as a uh, either an educational psychologist or a clinical psychologist um, usually it requires doing a master's degree um, uh, next in psychology and then there are routes on to um in the uk at least um uh usually funded um, but, but PhDs in either educational or clinical or uh, criminal, occupational, and then there's also criminology, um, uh, uh, psychology. Um, so a, a major route for our students is either clinical or, or educational psychology. So it requires further study. But again, the kind of broad um, uh, series of, of, of subjects that we have on our, on our, on our degree prepares students really well to apply for both those masters and PhD programs. Um, and it means that in terms of educational psychology, you, know, some, you might just go through a psychology route, um, do a psychology undergrad, do a psychology masters, do a psychology PhD. That would, that's great, actually, it's a great route. But I think the education studies route gives you the kind of richer, broader base that means that you're looking at these different disciplines um, and getting a literacy within them. You're looking at education specifically and child development specifically, um, and then going through on that pathway. And I think it, it creates a, a very successful one. Um, uh, and it's the same with clinical psychology. I think having this broad series of subjects is really important as a basis for then going on to um, uh, a PhD, even in, in, in clinical psychology. This comes back to something of what we're just saying about echo chambers, actually. Subjects themselves can become like echo chambers. Right? So if you just do one subject, of course, the methodologies and the ways of working, the literature can be really narrow and it becomes increasingly narrow as you specialize. But the education studies degree tries to resist that by getting psychologists talking to philosophers who probably disagree with each other and sociologists talking to um, historians who might disagree with each other. And students are in the middle of that. And part of what we ask them to do is to make sense of these different debates between different disciplines, which is a really great foundation then for going on to 
um, further study and qualification um, within psychology or a range of other technical disciplines. Fantastic. Great. I hope that's good. And obviously it fits in with a lot of the career advice we always do about being more flexible and having that ability Absolutely. to be able to take on different ideas. It's obviously quite a key skill, in whatever industry you're going into in the future. Now, I've I got one that's quite interesting. It's something that I picked up on just from you, um, your talk there. Um, it was actually the, the, the stuff that Jan Derry was working on, which is, I guess you're kind of going to quite a kind of, like you say, quite hard science in a way, you're starting to move into neuroscience. So I'm going to give you quite a tabloid question here, see if I can get a question out of you. If you looked at, say, sport, uh, if you looked at, say, a football team, um, uh, they train very differently now. 20 years ago, the goalkeeper and the centre forward pretty much did the same type of physical training, simply because they just had to get fit to a certain degree. Now they all do very specialist physical training based on their body type, uh, based on their position and things like that. Is that where education's going, do you think? Do you think the, the individual is going to be looked at far more? And some of us, you know, I guess old things like, is someone a visual learner or, or whatever? Are we going to... Are people going to be taught in different ways depending on who they are, do you think? That's a fantastic question. So there's a major debate, particularly between philosophers and, and, and neuroscientists um, in education about this exact issue. Um, neuroscience, kind of a lot of neuroscience, not all of it, kind of does want to move in this direction of individualism, as in we can look at a brain or we can look at someone's capabilities and we can tailor education to those abilities to therefore optimize what it is that they can do within the education system. And the football analogy is a great one, right? So, you know, your, your, your diet and your exercise regime is gonna be directly targeted at your body type in order to make you the best player that you can be. And this would be the same in the education system. I think Jan's work in particular disagrees with this um, and would say, yes, this is maybe a good starting point to some extent, but let's also make sure that we keep possibilities for especially children open. So the brain is very plastic and the brain will respond to social environments um, and to social settings and educational environments as well. And so we've got to be really careful about diagnosing a child as being something very early on and then only giving them the kind of education that suits that, that thing, rather than saying, well, okay, look, they're at that point now, maybe we need to think about the broad set of experiences that might help that child develop in different directions. So in a sense, neuroscience, I mean, it's, it's unfair to characterize all neuroscience like this because there's excellent work going on in, in neuroscience education. But philosophers like Jan would say, it's really important not to be deterministic, to use a technical term, to say that you're, who you are when you're five determines who you'll be when you're 15 or 20 or 25, and that we should be keeping experiences as open as possible. Um, uh, yeah, so I think one really great phrase to think of Jan right now, uh, something she says is, she quotes is that genes, that's our genetics, express themselves in a chemical environment. And we could say this about brains too, that we have a blueprint, of course, but our chemical or our social environment acts upon that blueprint um, uh, to, to give us a, a broad set of possibilities. So I say yes, definitely pay attention to where people are at right now. But let's keep open what's possible for them in terms of what we're giving young people um, so that they have a broad set of possibilities open to them in the future. Fantastic, Jack. Yeah. We, we've got another question here from one of the students, and this is um, picking up on something you had, you had said earlier. So uh, how would someone measure social and cultural capital? Or is it more subjective thing uh, that has to be measured differently based on the student person? What, what's, do you have some system maybe... I guess from a UK or perhaps a global perspective, because uh, they could be very different things. They're certainly different in the UK than they are in the States, for example. So what, what, how do you measure that? Yeah, that's really good. It's a really good question as well. So economic capital is quite easy to measure because of course we have indices that tell us what an average income might be. And so we can look at how someone's economic capital based on their family income, based upon an average within the area that they live in. Social and cultural capital, of course, as the question suggests, is a lot more difficult to measure. So in a sense, I, I might not use the term subjective, but subjective is getting us somewhere in terms of how it is that we might be appraising someone's social or cultural capital. I suppose the important thing that we do is that we look at the dominant trends within a particular society. So part of Bourdieu's work is thinking about who it is that gets to make a decision about what schools look like, about what's on the curriculum, um, and what's being studied. And if there's a particular group with a certain social and cultural capital who are getting to make those decisions about what's on the curriculum, what schools are like, 
who gets to go to certain schools, education policy, etc. By default, they're likely, if they're not being really careful, to design an education system that suits people like them. Uh, because, of course, the image of the ideal student is someone like them. And this means that someone with different social and cultural capital then has some kind of disadvantage in accessing that education system that's been built really for, for someone else. So it's difficult to measure social and cultural capital, but we can begin to see the ways in which people's social and cultural capital might be different. Um, and whereas we might not need to necessarily measure how different it is, as long as we know it's different, we can begin to see the ways in which an education system might have been configured in, in, in one to, to suit one form of social and educational capital and not another. And we can therefore, as policymakers as well as teachers, come in and say, look, let's design this environment again to make sure it's inclusive of, or at least not providing barriers to um, uh, the most uh, uh, marginal. Uh, students in, in, in society. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're coming right up to time now. So I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, just to say, this is something I, I probably end up asking everyone in, in, in one way or another. And there are some um, areas where it seems more germane than others. And that is really kind of looking at education as I guess as an industry over the next kind of 10, 20 years, we've obviously seen almost unprecedented change really over such a small amount of time uh, with the move to extensive online learning and other things. What do you see as the kind of big changes in education over the next few years? What would you highlight as two or three major areas of development? Uh, it's, again, it's an amazing question. I wish I had like, another half hour to talk to you about this. That's a really amazing question. So, um, so one, technology is really big. I think technology is going to be taking a lot of jobs, um, a change in the way in which we do jobs, and we need to prepare young people to be really fast-footed um, and to be creative within this changing economy on the one hand. On the other hand, I think we'll see the internationalization of education. I think education specific to localities will begin to diminish as the world becomes increasingly globalized. So in a sense, we need to be educating global citizens who are able to be active across a variety of geographical and cultural spaces. But finally, and this relates back to this, the, the World Bank example that I just touched upon in, in, in my presentation, I'm really interested that the World Bank has stopped or at least is reducing its measurement of a country's success based on how much money it makes, and instead are thinking about how many chances there are for individuals to improve their lives, flourish, to skill up, um, and to, again, be that kind of really fast-footed, adaptable citizen that I talked about um, in, my, in the first example. I think if the World Bank, who are really thinking about policy directions and the way that the economy is moving forward in the next 100 years, are focusing in on education and personal development as one of their main indicators. We can think about education as being one of the, the central, if not industries, then at least central activities for the world moving forward over the next 100 years. And I think this is part and parcel of this expansion of what we think of education out of just teacher, student in a classroom and thinking more broadly about education as really examining what it is to become a human being um, and to become part of um, this increasingly globalized world. Brilliant. Thanks. That's a fantastic answer and end to a fantastic session. Um, you've got a lot of love in the chat from a few parents and some other people there, Jack, for your contributions today. So uh, much appreciated by everyone here. Um, thank you, everyone, oh, thank for joining us. Again, as always with this, if you do want to ask a question, um, we'll all stay on just for another five minutes or so, uh, just so in case you want to come on and speak to either myself, uh, Jack or Hannah, who obviously works at UCL. If not, we'd like to say good evening to everyone and please do join us again for the next one and Shazza will advertise that to you as soon as she can. So thank you, every, thank you very much and good night. Thanks.